Um, good afternoon, Minister O'Gorman, uh, members of the steering committee, colleagues, uh, friends who are with us in person today, and our 75 online guests. And um, as my daughter Sarah taught me to say, hey, hey gays, girls, and gays. <laughs> <laughs> so, delighted to welcome you all to the launch of this uh, LGBTQI plus clinic. Uh, the last 12 months have seen a number of firsts for Black. We've been engaged in a number of radically different but significant, significantly related projects this year, the, the last two of which were bookending this week. So later this week, we'll have the fruits of our work with ENAR on the Equal Access Project and uh, with our first face-to-face -face meeting of the Equality Advocate Champions, who through the project received training on how to bring a race discrimination claim. And we'll shortly be launching the final paper in the series Pillar to Post with Paul Joyce's unique analysis of the issues surrounding debt and credit. But today, right here and now, FLAC is very proud to stand uh, for equality and to continue to work for the LGBTQI community in Ireland by launching this service where lesbian, gay, non-binary, intersex and trans individuals can access high quality legal advice in a safe and supportive environment. We have some history in this regard, having acted for Lydia Foy for over 20 years with three sets of legal proceedings until she received her birth cert in her preferred gender and progressive legislation was introduced. As everyone knows, FLAC is about access to justice and equality has to be the central foundation to access to justice. And by this, we mean equal access to information about legal rights, equal access to legal representation if necessary, and access to effective remedies in the courts and in the WRC, and also of paramount importance are fair and just laws that provide for a sufficient core body of necessary rights. So we have come a very long way in terms of equality for the LGBTQI community. What would gay marriage, what would the equality legislation prohibiting discrimination, harassment and victimization in employment, goods and services, accommodation and education. Trans people now can have their gender legally recognized and there is rights to adoption, to name just a few of the recent developments. But we're keenly aware that the LGBTQI plus community still experience discrimination, stigmatization and harassment. And this experience can be exacerbated by the absence of access to legal advice and representation. So we still have a long way to go before there's full equality in practice and in effect. Data from the EU Fundamental Rights Agency reported that 18% of LGBTIQ plus people surveyed in Ireland felt discriminated against in the prior year, with the staggering 38% having experienced discrimination in at least one area of life, such as going to a restaurant, hospital, or a shop. We know that discrimination can lead to high rates of emotional distress, depression, and anxiety and may have serious adverse consequences for individuals' financial, mental, and physical well-being. We also see increasing discrimination against trans people in contemporary discourse. And some of the vile discourse against the trans community reminds me very much of the vile discourse against the gay community when I was growing up. However, despite the extent of discrimination being experienced by LGBTQI people, claims under the Equal Status Act are reducing. This raises serious questions as to whether existing equality rights are sufficient and enforceable. We know that there's no legal aid for discrimination claims, no matter how important, complex, or sensitive the issue may be. FLAC, as everyone knows, runs a telephone information line and a network of clinics where people can get basic legal information. We know that the LGBT QI community, by and large, doesn't access these services, and we're not sure why, and we'd like to find out why. We do know that when we established LG pop up targeted LGBTQI legal clinics with the assistance of the late great Katie Dawson, there was a significant demand for these clinics. And when we meet with the NGOs in this sector, they point us to significant ongoing unmet legal need. We don't know the extent of unmet legal need generally in Ireland, or specifically among the LGBTIQ plus community. And we don't know the precise social and financial consequences of this unmet need. However, 
The strong civil justice system increases social inclusion and is a vital tool for holding the state and other powerful bodies to account. In this regard, we know from our work um, in our clinics, the, uh, our, phone, our phone line, our clinics, the Roma Clinic, which is also funded by the Ministry of the Department, and the Traveller Legal Clinic, the enormous cost in not having an effective justice system. And to quote Marsha P. Johnson, there cannot be pride for some without liberation for all. And it is for this reason we started a project exploring unmet legal need in the LGBTQI plus community, including a pilot legal, legal clinic where people can access free legal advice. We hope to find out whether claims are not being pursued because of a lack of information as to rights, or maybe the model of delivery of legal services needs to be changed. We want to know our claims not being pursued because of a lack of legal aid, or because of what goes on in the Workplace Relations Commission, or are there insufficient guarantees of anonymity, and are there procedural and other barriers uh, that we need to deal with? Or is it the law itself which needs to be amended? Black has campaigned successfully for two major reviews, which we hope this clinic and research will con contribute to in an evidence-based way. Last year, along with 45 NGOs, we campaigned for a root and branch review of the civil legal aid scheme. And the Department of Justice has committed to review and we're very keen to participate in it and hope it will start shortly. This project should provide concrete critical evidence on the extent of unmet legal need in the LGBTQI plus community to this review and perhaps provide a model of what an appropriate service should look like. Last year we ran a series of lunchtime seminars to mark 20 years of legal status legislation and we were delighted that Minister O'Gorman at the last seminar agreed to our request to carry out a comprehensive review of the equality legislation. We then worked in partnership with IREC to equip civil society to make submissions to this review. We had roundtables with over 80 representatives of civil society organisations. We drafted a guide to help NGOs make submissions and we submitted our own uh, detailed submission. We also anticipate that the work of this clinic will produce concrete learning for this review and we look forward to this vital review being progressed. A significant feature of this project is that it has a steering group made up of representatives from relevant NGOs, NGOs including the Switchboard, the Gay Project, Dundalk Outcomers, Amok LGBT, Gosh, Intersex Ireland, uh, Link, um, sorry, I lost my, my spot here, and some uh, Tenny, HIV Ireland, and some academics. We have an equivalent group in our Traveller Legal Project and value greatly the guidance from the committee and it helps ensure that the work we do is relevant, it's effective, it's targeted and is in, impactful. So I want to pay a huge thanks to members of the steering committee and policy are from, uh, from the committee today. I want also to send a special get well to Judy Walsh, who, was, who we were hoping would be here today, and she's provided invaluable guidance by this project. I hope, Judy, you're watching us online, and uh, we'll be hearing from Paula shortly. I also want to thank Killian and James, uh, the barristers who provide legal advice, who we will hear from later. And thanks to our staff, Sinead Lucy, who I think conceived <laughs> of the project, Chris Bowes for his contribution to making this project happen, and also Susan and Caroline, Liz and Karina for making today happen. While it's unfair to pick out one person, I really have to pay a particular tribute to my colleague Stephanie Lord, who has given her all in getting this project up and running. So we wouldn't be here today, so I want to give a, a special huge to Stephanie. I'd like to introduce you to, to the Minister and thank you, Minister, for your support, for funding this project and for the commitment to review the equality legislation, for coming here to be with us here today in person and to celebrate with us the launch of this project. <laughs> thanks, uh, thanks very much, Irish, and this and uh, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Uh, it's absolutely brilliant to be here. And, and it's just great to finally be, be having in-person events and, and being able to, to talk talk directly and, and properly to people. 
Uh, I want to thank uh, Eilish and Stephanie for the uh, invitation to speak today, to be, to be part of this uh, uh, recognition of, of, of this fantastic pro project. Uh, I would just, before I start, just like to take the opportunity to uh, acknowledge the amazing work that FAP does, both in terms of the very individualized work it does with, with people to help them understand their legal rights, grant them access to justice. I know that's done in such a, a supportive and professional manner by the team in FLAP and has been done so for, for such a long period of time. And I know that there are thousands of people across our country who have benefited from that confidential legal information and legal advice every year. Um, and that direct engagement with so many people who need that, that support, it puts FLAC in such a good uh, position to kind of understand on the ground what are the needs of uh, individuals, what are the needs of particular groups, who, um, who face who face gaps, who face barriers in terms of being able to access uh, legal uh, legal information and indeed access justice. And I know you've already highlighted maybe two of the very specific areas for, for travellers and of course the, the, the Roma project as well, groups that would otherwise probably not be in a position to receive any uh, any sort of support, uh, any sort of support at all. But I think you also are so active on that kind of macro level as well in terms of lobbying for, 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 for major change across the country. You spoke about the, um, the, 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 the review of the Equality Act, and I'll speak about that a little bit more later on. But that was, that was directly this lady putting the pressure on me in a couple of Zoom calls um, and identifying, I suppose, that opportunity to uh, to, to, to undertake that, that root and branch uh, review. And also just to say that the legal aid review, which you spoke about, I think actually needs to actually bring that to cabinet tomorrow. So we'll hopefully be seeing hearing an announcement for the, the, the kicking off of another really important uh, piece in, in terms of ensuring wider access to justice for people across our, our, our country. Um, it'll be June uh, later this week, and that means it's Pride Month. Uh, and when I spoke at the event on uh, conversion therapy that uh, that, that all in LGBT Ireland held um, the week before last, I suppose acknowledged that uh, Pride this year is taking uh, place in the shadow. It's a shadow of two brutal killings uh, that took place in, 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 in Sligo, Aidan Moffat and, uh, and Michael Snee. But it's also a shadow of an uh, increase in homophobic and transphobic attacks that are taking place on the streets of our towns and cities, you know, particularly, uh, particularly here in Dublin. Uh, and this weekend, we marked the seventh anniversary of marriage equality. Uh, and, you know, on a day like that, we recognise the huge steps forward the country has taken. We recognise where we are vis-a-vis -vis so many countries across Europe, and it's a good place. It is a good place, but the work isn't finished yet, uh, and we have been reminded uh, very tragically uh, in the last number of, uh, of, of, of weeks, in particular, that there is so much work to do, and it takes everyone. It takes the community. Uh, it takes the NGOs, but it takes the government. It takes the state to take a, an important role as well. I look forward by the end of this year to hate crime legislation finally being enacted, hate crime legislation that will um, that, that will finally criminalize attacks in our community, tax based on race, tax attacks based on their on, on, on disability. Uh, and we have to get the legislation through it, and we will do that, but we also have to support on Garda Khanna and the wider judicial system in terms of how to effectively prosecute uh, these, uh, these, these, these crimes. The reason we're here today is to launch FLAC's project uh, addressing unmet legal needs in the LGBTI plus community. Um, and last year, uh, the government supported LGBTI plus groups with over 1.5 million in funding uh, through the LGBTI plus community <coughs> services funding call. Uh, and the project we're launching today is one of the beneficiaries of that funding call. Uh, and I'm really pleased that my department has been able to provide some support in terms of, of, of advancing this really important project. Um, the project it provides tailored legal advice and advocacy to LGBTI plus people uh, through a specialised legal advice clinic. Um, and this is a one of the direct actions that's set out in the National LGBTI plus inclusion strategy. Uh, and it is part of that recognition by government that minority groups do require tailored uh, tailored supports. And I know FLAC has that really strong um, 
track record in terms of providing tailored uh, legal advice to particular groups, and I suppose in the in the situations in in, in a way that they can best engage with those uh, with those supports uh, as well. And today's initiative is another really important um, piece of work that that FLAC is leading on, and it's going to provide an absolutely invaluable service to uh, members of the LGBTI plus community across our country. Uh, and we know that even still our community is uh, facing disproportionate uh, impact of discrimination uh, and that can have uh, an impact on members of our community in a whole range of areas from education to employment to access to healthcare and, and, and housing. Um, and I think by undertaking this particular clinic, FLAC is in a really good position to ensure uh, that the LGBTI plus community has accurate and relevant uh, uh, information in relation to, to, to our legal rights. And I know it's particularly exciting for me as minister to see the impact of the fund my, my department has, um, has provided and know that it's going to make an impact on the lives of, of, of many people in our community. Um, services like those provided by FLAC uh, are, are vital in ensuring that members of the LGBTI plus community are supported in asserting their rights under the law and it's incumbent on us as a government uh, to ensure that anyone from a minority community is fully protected under the law. Uh, and as uh, it referenced last year, we launched that public consultation to uh, inform a review of the Equality Acts, the Equal Status Acts and the Employment Equality Acts uh, to examine their functionality, their, their effectiveness uh, in both combating discrimination and pr promoting uh, e equality. Uh, and particularly, we want to look at the effectiveness of the legislation in terms of someone taking the case, someone seeking to use the provisions to, uh, to, uh, to, to, to protect their own legal situation. And you made the point in terms of things reducing uh, or, or under the, the legislation, and that's something we have to be conscious of uh, this legislation needs to be fit for purpose. It was really strong legislation when it was drafted 20 years ago, and I think we need to recognise that the 20 years is a long time, and, and, and things uh, things have, uh, ha, ha, have changed. Um, and I think we have to look at are there practical obstacles, are there legal uh, obstacles to the uh, full use, the full realisation of rights, and are there things there that are actually deterring uh, people from minority groups from seeking to uh, to vindicate their rights under this uh, this legislation. Also, part of the review two program for government commitments being addressed, looking at the issue of um, whether the existing legislation uh, provides specific protection for gender identity. That's something we clearly identified and clearly named in undertaking the review. And also then the uh, consideration of the introduction of uh, socioeconomic discrimination as a grounds. And I know that's something that has campaigned on uh, for a long time and, and, and I hope we will be able to uh, to, to, to progress that. Um, so as we know, we've had the, the written uh, uh, submissions. Uh, these are being currently analysed by my department. I hope to publish the outcome of the public consultation later on this year and um, I think looking just being upfront it'll probably be next year before we see um, before we see heads of builders but a, a long uh, legislative pipeline going on in my department at the moment but I am absolutely determined to see this uh, this review through and so bringing forward amendment legislation uh, on foot of the uh, the the uh, the input that we, we, we've gotten from, from so many NGOs who have the, the practical experience uh, in, in, in this field. So look, I'd like to finish up again by thanking Ailish and thanking Stephanie for the invitation to speak here today. Um, this project, this service is going to be, a, as I said, of absolutely crucial benefit and uh, um, uh, be crucially beneficial in supporting the LGBTI plus community in Ireland. As we know, our community does face unique challenges when it comes to um, family law, to gender recognition, immigration, and also access to healthcare. Um, and as we know, the services that, that are being launched today, it's not just about providing tailored legal advice, but it will also inform research uh, in the area. And I think that's really important as well to actually get that, uh, that insight into what are the areas that you know, the demand is highest and, and, and how does that shape the government and, and future government's wider res, re, re, response. So a huge congratulations to FLAC and all the team for developing this project and also to all the uh, partners uh, in the LGBTI plus community, all the organisations who are working so uh, so closely with them. And look, uh, I wish the project the very best and I do look forward to reading the, the research when it's completed uh, and adding on as well. So thanks very much.
very much, uh, Minister, and thank you for your very kind comments about Blackburn and the occasion. And it's great to hear news about the development of both uh, reviews. Uh, I look forward to hearing about the CBA tomorrow, but also to the publication mm -hmm. on the summary of the submission later this year. So thank you again, and thank you for, for your support. I think you're actually able to stay a little while longer. Um, I'll just hand, hand over to my colleague, Stephanie, who's going to uh, MC the rest of the announcements. Thank you, Eilish. Um, Fáilte rúb gach dinia, an sá nuacht fáisín tach an orad sin dini eachal, uh, an sá cun tapu lin. Uh, you're all very welcome here tonight. My name is Stephanie Lord, and I'm the Legal and Policy Officer with Black. And I've had the enormous privilege of convening the steering group for the LGBTQI plus OMET Legal Needs Research Project. Um, Eilish has talked a bit about the groups that we are, we're working with. Uh, they're a fantastic group, and it's great to be up to, to have you all here this evening um, and we really appreciate the time and expertise that's been put into the group by the participants. We know that we're a long way from equality, we know that LGBTQI people experience more acute inequalities, trans people are regularly denied access to hormones, leaving them with little option but to DIY their own health care. Queer people seeking international protection are often subject to incredibly invasive lines of questioning and intersex children are often subject to unnecessary medical interventions and non-binary genders aren't legally recognised. And it's for all of these reasons and more that we've established this LGBTQI research project and the service that we're going to talk or that we're going to launch here today. So you're all really very welcome and it's great to see such gender and sexual diversity in this room. Um, I won't keep you too long, so I just want to say thanks so much and we appreciate your support. I'm really delighted to introduce uh, the speakers that we have working with the FLAC, or working uh, in our FLAC clinic. Um, Killian Bracken is a practicing barrister specializing in public law and judicial review in the areas of immigration and asylum, employment and equality, social welfare, housing and data protection, and Killian accepts instructions in all areas of administrative law and <laughs> 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 He's a graduate of UCC and the London School of Economics. And Gillian was also taught in Trinity College Dublin um, and NUIT Galway. Uh, and he's a lecturer in Constitutional Law and Judicial Review in Griffith College Dublin. Um, so I will just hand you over to. Uh, oh, James first. My apologies. <laughs> James, of an error. Uh, James is a practicing barrister specializing in public law, particularly childcare, um, employment, immigration, non discrimination law and constitutional law. James completed his PhD at the School of Law at Trinity College Dublin, for which he received scholarships from both the Government of Ireland and Trinity College Dublin. Outside the bar, James is an academic and lecturer, currently teaching fellow at Trinity College Dublin. James has le co-lectured Trinity's Constitutional Law 2 module and is currently lecturer of the Foundations of Law, Mooting and Clinical Legal Education modules. Stellar qualifications there. Thanks very much. I'll hand you over to James. Thank you very much, everyone. And like Kilian, I'm also available for any instructions. <laughs> Thank you all very much for coming on a rainy Monday afternoon. Um, it's marvelous to see so many people here and to know so many are joining us online. Um, and I'm um, just going to say on behalf of myself and Killian, just a huge thanks to Chris and Sinead and Hannah and Stephanie for the work that was into running this clinic because it, um, it takes a human, tremendous amount of work. And so um, I, I'm very, both Killian and I are very grateful to the tremendous amount of work that goes into it from the staff here at FLAC. I'm going to speak very briefly. I'm not going to keep you very long. Um, I'm sort of going through what we've done so far in the clinic. So we've running since March, during March time. Um, but this is our first formal launch that we're having for it. Um, we've had numerous referrals to our clinic. First of all, they could only occur through LGBT organisations um, around the country, and we've received referrals from all over, um, all over Ireland, from Galway, and Cork, and um, one from Limerick and from Dublin. Um, we now also accept self-referrals um, through the FLAC website, so um, if you know anyone uh, or, or themselves in need, um, 
want to access the services, we are available through the self-referral um, website. The main target of our, let me talk, the main focus of our work so far has been on state bodies as opposed to private law. So you know, individuals who are suing or, or not su uh, um, assessing their legal rights in regards to the HSE or you know, housing bodies, that kind of thing. We've also received some private law um, inquiries to do with family rights. So there's a couple who are separating in regards parentage of their children and that being recognized under the law and discrimination in private places of clubs. But the primary area has been against state bodies. Um, something which we have encountered, um, and Killian will speak about this in, in greater depth, I think, is that the people who come to us at the clinic are often you know, quite um, marginalized and vulnerable people who need legal help but can't always access it. Um, as easily as perhaps should be the case. Um, and they're going up against huge state agencies, sometimes several at once, particularly in the area of um, trans affirmative healthcare, you can be up against three different state um, agencies who don't always talk to each other. So it can be quite a complex thing to un untangle. And, you know, Kelly and I are both quite embarrassed and we find it confusing. So I can imagine the difficulty this poses for um, those who have not been able to access um, legal representation. I'm going to pass over to Killian now, and he's going to talk sort of more about the substantive cases that we've had. Um, but I just want to once again echo my tremendous um, gratitude to Flack for this opportunity um, and look forward to your questions afterwards. Thank you very much. Thanks, folks. Um, again, like James, I might just echo thanks to Stephanie and to Sinead and to Chris. Um, James and I really are just passengers, I suppose, because there, there really wouldn't be any clinic without them. Um, James said out, we've obviously been substantively faced with a variety of legal issues. And I think there's probably a perception that the LGBTQI community would be quite monolithic in the issues that it faces, for example, maybe discrimination, but we really tend to see a huge intersection with a variety of issues. For example, persons with disabilities, members of the traveler community, um, and this tends to often have a compounding effect. So, so vulnerable people tend to come to us with perhaps an issue related to their sexual orientation or their gender identity. And then this itself then will disclose further issues that they have, um, which require um, some sort of attention. Um, so, you know, dealing then with, I suppose, the minutiae of it and, and to, 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 to hit on, I suppose, what the purpose of the clinic is and what the minister has referenced you know, what are the issues? Why is it that members of the LGBTIQ um, community are facing these issues? It seems to us certainly so far that there's really a multiplicity of issues. One is obviously really the opacity in procedures, um, things like time limits, people don't know that you obviously have to institute an equal status case within two, uh, two months or, or notify rather the, the respondent to that. Obviously costs is a huge issue. Um, and really, I think most importantly, is really just access to information. People don't actually even know where to begin. Uh, they don't know who to talk to first, where to start. And even if they did, then obviously how they afford that. Um, and I think associated with that then too is this fact that even for us, for James and I, dealing with the people who come to the clinic, as he said, initially it was through referrals from LGBT organizations and now it's through self-referrals. We even still think that obviously permeating the sorts of communities where they tend to have the most legal issues is often itself quite difficult. Um, so ultimately, while I hope, of course, and I do think that the results of the clinic in determining where and what the sources of one legal need are, I think as well, it's probably worth saying that the places that don't come up with the people that don't come to us are probably just as important. And there probably are reasons for that. So, you know, as I said, members of the travel community, members of the Roma community, um, might have more difficulty of coming forward, whether that be because of language or structural issues and things like that. And of course, James and I are both particularly conscious of our own um, our own backgrounds, which put us at a disadvantage because, I mean, you know, we obviously can't properly empathize with someone in a variety of situations, which really affects how good we can help someone. So we really have to recognize our own downfalls in that respect. I think, you know, Overall, when we look back at the clinic, and hopefully, of course, the results will be 
it's really, really useful to the department, of course, and, and more generally, we do have to recognize those faults as well. Um, but of course, you know, uh, I will echo what James said, which is to really, you know, consciously and determinedly encourage people if they do have problems to come forward and refer themselves or contact FLAC, we'll obviously be able to help them with respect to that. And hopefully that we will be able to um, put the clinic to the best use possible uh, and give people, uh, you know, the help that they, do, they need to deserve in overcoming the barriers, the obvious barriers and things. Thank you. So much to Kay and James. Um, I also want to make people aware that uh, at the end of the discussion or after our speakers have finished, uh, there'll be an opportunity for questions and answers. And for people who are watching at home, if you would like to um, add your questions now in the Zoom comment box, please, please feel free to do so. And if we don't get to them, uh, please leave your email address and we'll, we'll do our best to come back to you. Um, our next speaker I'm delighted to introduce um, a fellow drama woman, Paula Fagan, uh, the CEO of LGBT Ireland, leading uh, the organisation's dynamic staff and volunteer team. Paula has been involved with LGBTI plus activism for many years. She holds an MSc in Women's Studies. LGBT Ireland is a national organisation underpinned by local localised knowledge and responses. Uh, together with their network members, they provide support, training and advocacy, which aims to improve the lives of LGBT people across Ireland. Paula is also a member of our steering group for this project. Thank you, Stephanie, and thank you everyone uh, for inviting me here to speak at the launch of the LGBTQ Legal Clinic. And thanks so much to James and Killian. It was so lovely to hear of your work and thanks for the, your work and your thoughtfulness as well and your approach. And um, I think I speak on behalf of all LGBTIQ plus organizations across the country and else is here from the Gay Project in Cork and others I'm sure are watching online. When I say how hugely welcome this development is, as we regularly receive calls and emails for people in urgent need of legal support, but the reasons that you so uh, articulately uh, are typically outlined there, Killian and James. I think as we've already said, LGBTQI plus people have complex and often unique, unique legal needs, which are compounded by barriers to accessing justice to address those needs. Our community is disproportionately affected by discrimination, harassment, violence, and social exclusion, but can often cannot seek legal redress due to the barriers facing them. And from, as we've already said, many people within our communities have overlapping intersectional identities, which increase their level of legal need. We work with many member LGBTIQ plus members of the traveling Roma communities, people living in the international protection accommodation system, people with disabilities, rainbow families, and of course, LGBTQI plus people in the prison system. All of them have, have you, all of them experiences discrimination, systemic inequality, and legal problems. Our recent experience of working in partnership with Black, firstly in application for the full implementation of the Children's and Family Relations Tract, and following its commencement and providing in, following its commencement and providing information on how to navigate the new law, provides clear evidence of the difference that a specific and targeted support can make. Thanks to the Trojan work of Stephanie Lord, who represented FLAC at our strategic legal working group, and of course, the late Katie Dawson, BL, who spoke at several of our webinars and who supported individual families directly. We were able to provide legal information and support to hundreds of families, firstly through online events and afterwards through our joint FAQ documents. This information directly supported families and indeed solicitors and court clerks across the country to navigate the court process involved in the re-registration of over 170 same-sex parents to re-register the births of their children. While many families thankfully had a positive court experience, unfortunately minority did not and had to fight very hard to vindicate their children's rights to have both of their parents legally recognised. Even though these were con consent applications and the parents met all of the criteria as set out in the Act. This is a recent reminder of the lack of knowledge and understanding about the current law that pertains to LGBTQ families. And unfortunately, of the unconscious bias 
that still prevails and must be addressed to ensure equity in our justice system. This example relates to accessing family rights. However, we also have other examples where actual or the fear of unconscious bias within the justice system has had an impact on LGBTQ individuals and their families in access and justice. It is against this backdrop that this new clinic is so warmly welcomed. As well as the opportunity that this new service offers to individuals, we're also very conscious of the potential wider implications of this service to further, further progress rights and protections for the community. We are keenly aware of the rights, of many of the rights we enjoy here in Ireland have been brought forward thanks to strategic litigation taken through the courts. Here again, I want to recognise, and I know I just mentioned it earlier, Flax work in the decades of, le of long legal battles to support Dr. Lydia Foy to have her gender recognition legally recognised, which led the way for the Gender Recognition Act in 2015. In the CSO's Equality and Discrimination Survey of 2019, LGBTQI plus respondents recorded the highest rates of perceived discrimination at 33%. Those who identified as trans, intersex, and non binary, and LGBT people who face additional intersectional identities are particularly vulnerable to discrimination, as we've already said. As Eilish mentioned, the Fundamental Rights Agency Equality Survey in 2019, the Irish data showed that 59% of intersex respondents and 56 of trans respondents had experienced discrimination across eight areas of life, including work, housing, healthcare, education, and social spaces. There's no doubt that we've come a long way in Ireland, but these stark statistics show that the work and much work remains, and we look forward to working with FLAC and other organisations in the room to fight for justice so that Ireland can be truly safe, supportive, and inclusive country for all LGBTQ plus people. Thank you. Thanks so much, Paula. Uh, our final speaker of the evening is Mary McAuliffe from UCD. Uh, Mary is a historian, lecturer and director of gender studies at UCD and is also a member of the board of MXF. Uh, she specialises in Irish women's and gender history, trauma histories of gender and sexual violence of Ireland's revolutionary period and histories of sexualities. She completed her BA, MA and PhD at the School of History and Humanities Trinity College Dublin. Her most recent publication was a biography of the feminist, trade union activist and revolutionary woman, Margaret Skinner. She is co-editor with Emily Pine and Mary Potton of Commemoration, Gender and the Post-Colonial Car Carceral State, published by Manchester University Press in November 2021. <clears throat> and Dr. Mary McAuliffe will give us some of the historical context of why we're here today. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Minister and members of FLAC and everybody here today. And thank you, Steffi, for inviting me to this. Excuse the uh, nasal uh, sound. Uh, it isn't COVID. <laughs> <laughs> I'm delighted to be here to say a few words uh, and at this launch of the pilot LGBTQI plus legal clinic. Now, saying a few words is very difficult for a historian, but I'll try and, and keep it to that. And in saying that, obviously, I will take a historic rather than a legal perspective. I leave the, the legal to the experts. I've been thinking about what to say to you today. Um, my own research, as, as Steffi said, is on gender histories and the histories of sexualities, uh, mainly looking at queer female sexualities, which is inclusive of all female identities. Most recently, I've been working through this seemingly endless decade of centenaries. Um, how many years has it been now? 20. Um, on the activism, contributions, experiences, and particularly the experiences of violence, legacy, and the memories of revolutionary women in the War of Independence and the Civil War. However, and indeed almost by chance, a rather fascinating section of that research uncovered a number of leading revolutionary and suffrage women who were in same-sex relationships throughout this period. Some of them you may know, you may have heard of them. Dr. Kathleen Lynn, for instance, and Madeleine French Mullen, and actually a plaque to both of them is going up next month in Charlemagne Street, uh, which is a recognition both of their public work within uh, St. Dalton's Hospital, but also of their personal relationship 
Um, Elizabeth O'Farrell and Julia Brennan. Elizabeth O'Farrell was very famous for bringing out the surrender flag in 1916, but she did so much more and she spent her life with her partner, Julia Brennan. Margaret Skinner, whom I wrote the biography of, and her partner, Nora O'Keefe, Eva Gore Booth, sister of Countess Markovich, and Esther Roper. And some you may not know. Ella Young, a famous uh, cultural activist, uh, was active in 1916, went on to become professor of Celtic studies in Berkeley University, California. Um, I had a big crush on Maud Gaughan, uh, and <laughs> W.B. Yeats did not like her because he felt he, she was you know, interfering in his campaign to uh, seduce Maud. Uh, Helena Maloney, one of my favorites, an IB actress, uh, editor of Indian in, of the uh, Ban the Heron, the newspaper of Indian in the Heron, a um, uh, member of the Trade Union uh, Irish Women Workers Union. Um, she had her issues and her problems and, and, and many times had to um, uh, be uh, incarcerated basically in, in Grange Gorman where she met the love of her life, psychiatrist uh, Evelyn O'Brien. Margot Trench, to whom there are beautiful love letters from a suffrage woman, Judy Withers, in the National Library of Ireland. All of these histories were hidden, um, but it isn't that they didn't exist, they were there. Uh, it's just nobody went looking for them because they weren't deemed important in the same way LGBT lives weren't deemed important for the longest time. Uh, but now these research, the research on these histories is now the foundation uh, of a successful BAI application, I'm glad to say, and we will be filming the documentary about these women over the summer and it should be on TG Cahar in late autumn or early next year. So you might say, what, what has this all got to do, and it's all very lovely, with um, a pilot LGBTQI <laughs> legal clinic, clinic launch. Well, it's about representation and being seen. And it's about historical justice and justice in the contemporary. In many ways, similar to the recognition of an apology for the uh, criminalization of gay men, or the recognition that Roger Caseman's Black Diaries are real and do document his homosexual relationships. Or Dr. James Barry's pronouns should be he, him in any history or documentary of his life. It is about recognizing that our patriot dead can be and were queer, that we have a long queer Irish history, much of which is now being researched and written by some amazing young scholars, and those of us who are not so young anymore. Um, and those histories encompass the whole island and the diaspora and immigrants to this country. And yes, the recognition of queer identities among those in direct provision and among our most recent immigrants from the Ukraine. And it's very important to recognize that. I'm perhaps more exercised than usual about acknowledging our queer histories in all their complexities, joys, traumas, ordinariness, loves, etc., than usual, because of the backlash and uptick, as, as the minister mentioned himself, in homophobia, lesbophobia, transphobia, hence the real need for this, this legal clinic in wider society, not just in this country, but globally. Of course, this is accompanied by a virulent misogyny, but that's a conversation for another day. And indeed, you, you always find one with the other, it's, you know, they go hand in hand, unfortunately. Again and again, feminism and LGBT rights, feminist and LGBT rights are positioned as a threat to wider society. Being woke is categorized as deviancy. As one commenter, right wing, of course, in the Telegraph, and I won't even say his name, wrote recently, um, concentrating on equality and LGBT rights and pronouns allowed the West to ignore the threat of the, the rising threat of Russia and Putin, essentially blaming uh, campaigns for LGBT equality for the invasion of Ukraine. <laughs> Conversely, Putin and his cronies used the concept of the deviant West and its pride marches to excuse their actions. This is the world we live in. And it continues, uh, we continue to recognize that LGBT people, uh, LGBTQI people have always been part of our communities and that equality and legal standing is something worth achieving and defending. This legal clinic is part of ensuring, ensuring that a backlash to LGBTQI rights will not be countenanced. To preserve what we have gained as a community, 
We need our histories, our activism, our defenders, our equality laws, and we need to be always aware that what has been gained can be taken away. See Rovery Wade in the US as an example, unfortunately. So I'm delighted that we make a small bit of history here tonight. Um, and of course that builds on the huge histories that FLAC have with LGBTQI uh, equality campaigns, including, as has been mentioned, uh, the Dr. Lydia Fry campaign over a decade. It is part of our history. It is part of the needs that continue today. Well done to all who have worked on this. And particularly thank you, Steffi, for asking me to be here. And apologies for being slightly late. Uh, my friends would always say, you know, that's what I do anyway. Um, <laughs> and thank you, Flack, for this clinic uh, and for being part of making this community a fully integrated part of Irish society now and on into the future. Thank you very much. Thank you so much to all our speakers. This was really powerful and it's just, there's an exceptional amount of work that's undertaken by all of the individuals in this room. So it's, it's really, really great to have everyone here. Um, now we are going to move to the question and answers portion of the evening. We'll keep it relatively brief uh, and afterwards we'll have some refreshments and some entertainment. So please do uh, stay for that, it'll be great to have you. Um, so we've had some questions sent in from our online viewers already. One person asked, how can I get an appointment with the clinic? Uh, you can get an appointment in the clinic by sending your queries to lgbtqi at black.ie and someone will get in touch with you. Um, so before I move to the other questions that have been sent in in advance, uh, does anyone have any questions from the floor for any of our panelists? The Elsa in the front, fastest, fastest on first. Uh, yeah, thank you. Oh, sorry, and if you wouldn't mind uh, introducing your, just saying your name and if you're working with an organization, uh, just for our viewers at home, that would be great. Elsa Spindler, um, I run the Gay Project in Cork. I'm also on the steering committee for this uh, wonderful initiative. But actually, the point I'm going to raise is uh, me as an individual. Um, I hesitate to mention in this podcast probably that I'm an enthusiastic but very amateur litigant. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, the last two years have been taught that started to proceed the act under the Equality Act. Um, so I just wanted to make the point that I found I was lucky that the first one, they, they were both about gender identity issues, the first one there was very much a workplace one. So I wasn't put off by the fact that I had to go to the WRC, which seemed a weird place to go. If I had started with the second one, which was actually uh, me against um, yes, the Irish Rugby Football Union, so it was very much a, uh, a leisure thing, I still had to go to the WRC, and I think that's a big problem. It's, I'm sure there are many other factors, but that people, people aren't going to go there if, they, if it's something that's happening in sort of everyday life. So perhaps it's a question for the so minister uh, whether it's a, appropriate to think about reinstating the, the separate equality uh, conditions rather than having all the function with uh, workplace relations. Uh, yeah, no, I, I think that's one of the themes I think that's come up in certainly some of the submissions that have come in to, uh, to, to the consultation. Uh, and, uh, it is it is such it is a very strange um, setting to find yourself in and you are dealing with a, a non-work um, issue with very important but non like non work life issue in, in the context of the workplace relations committee, which is designed very much to deal uh, and has seen a lot of whole infrastructure but focused on uh, on, on, on employee employee relations. So I know that that is one of the things that um, that, that, that will be considered within the Thank you very much to the Minister. Uh, Lilith? Yeah, hi, uh, I'm Lilith, I'm from Teddy. Um, I guess I'm just, uh, um, I'm, it's 514 days since the collapse of healthcare for adolescents uh, for trans people, um, and the um, adult trans community are facing trying to attain your waiting list for uh, a site of pathologising of care 
and which um, should no longer really exist because uh, trans healthcare has been sexual health. <laughs> and I was just wondering, uh, James and Killian, if you could maybe speak to the types of cases that you have been uh, receiving uh, from the trans community and how much that is reflected in the issues around trans healthcare. Thanks very much. Uh, so we had a, without going into detail, of course, like we had a case recently that we had exactly on this involving a, uh, a trans girl who had previously, uh, who was told that she was being moved from Blue Rockers to HRT and then had been, uh, upon her returning at 16, and she's not 16, and she's not getting that, and there was no plan currently to provide it for her. Um, so, you know, it is, it is an instance where it, it, those are cases which I think they never expected to get in the job and certainly did some trickle through. And other cases in modern traffic, we've had a situation like, as well. But I think that, yeah, the absence of um, trans health care for the, the absence of trans health care and the, um, the flaws in the adult trans health care model. Yeah. Uh, I suppose, just additionally to that, I suppose the, the trans community as well had to effectively create their own workarounds to, to deal with these issues because of the absence of adequate healthcare in Ireland. So, have, you know, in my case, actually very effectively come up with workarounds. Um, but that is in spite of the stage helping, um, not because of it. And the small amount that we've seen really, I think, throws light on that. Trans people are being forced to take these things into their own hands because they simply can't pass it. Yeah. Or also, as you remember, there are also uh, cases that are also concerning people who travel overseas for um, gender affirming care and are always able to access safe gender affirming care overseas. And also, uh, sort of trans heritage come up. Yeah, right. Thanks very much. Uh, that was Killian and James, our uh, barristers, just to sort of sorry. <laughs> you know, uh, who answered those questions. Thank you. Um, we just have a couple of questions sent in from viewers at home that also you might be able to answer. So one is, is the clinic only in person or can it be accessed online? Uh, and can the clinic provide advice for those who've experienced discrimination on the basis of their sexual orientation or because they are trans? Well, I suppose, yes, the first one is um, it's available both in person and online, so whatever the preference of the person seeking support is. And then, secondly, uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks very much. Uh, okay, I have a question from uh, Wendy. And um, thanks, Wendy, I am the law sisters. Um, I, this is both for Stephanie or Irish, uh, black question, generally. Uh, you mentioned some of the groups that have. Intersecting identities with the LGBTI community, such as uh, members of the Roma and Family community. Um, but another group that has a very, very significant overlap with the LGBTI community is the sex workers. And I know from my own work that there is a huge unmet need for legal advice amongst sex workers and people who may not identify as sex workers but who are engaging in sex work coming together. And I was just wondering if that could have taken any steps to say, the sex workers' clients or um, you know, to, to to find out what kind of needs there are, and to you know, to make sure that everybody is providing uh, services to them in a non-judgmental way. Yeah, uh, I can take that question if that's okay with us. Yes, uh, we have we've taken preliminary steps to engage with sex workers. We're quite aware of the overrepresentation um, in. The sex work community of um, trans and queer individuals. Um, I think there is, I suppose, one of the one of the issues for us is that, and James and Hilly both touched on this, is uh, the kind of the the extent to which communities are marginalised and quite hard to reach in some respects. Um, so there is a sort of an issue around accessing uh, groups and, I suppose, accessing individuals in the absence of you know, there being homogenous groups of, of individuals. But we certainly are taking those steps and we are sort of in preliminary discussions with uh, with a small number of organisations about uh, about participating in the steering group. And I'd also like to say that, uh, you know, there are organisations or sex worker-led groups um, 
that you know at the door is open uh please you know send an email to back and, and get in touch because we would really really love uh to see that engagement it's really important uh, for us not only that uh, you know, initiatives uh that are that are geared towards the lgbtq community are not only it's it's not only that that, it, that there is a, a representation of LGBTQ people, but also where there are intersectional identities. You know, it, we want sex workers to be involved and we're going to be talking about those issues. Uh, so that's that's really important. So we have may we you know we have begun that work. So I hope that answers your question. Thank you. Um, there was another question from a person at home. Uh, what areas of law have arisen most frequently to date in the clinic? I would say we've had um, uh, maybe three or four cases of uh, same-sex parents who are trying to have their um, parentage recognised under law. So yeah, probably family law issues dealing with parentage and surrogacy, and then probably closely followed by discrimination and Yeah, some other housing cases as well, which often were not discrimination cases where someone is experiencing discrimination in other provision. Or uh, it's being at risk of being a bit uh, removed from their house. Yes, I, I think that's something that probably comes up for LGBT Ireland quite a lot. You know, we've worked with, uh, FLAC has worked with LGBT Ireland on, on those cases, so that is something that comes up quite frequently. I don't know if you want to make any comments or. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, from the National LGBT Health Alliance point of view, the, big, the two, single biggest legal issues are family rights and then immigration rights and more and more housing so that resonates certainly with the health fund yeah thanks thanks so much paula uh i'll just ask are there any more final questions before we wrap up elsa and i'll answer quickly it might be a bit sensitive Obviously, the Senate is mostly about finding services to individuals, but do you have in your mind that you're always on the lookout for good places for some strategic integration? Perhaps that's actually more corporate flash. <laughs> <laughs> Not to not to put you on the spot, but our managing solicitor Sinead Lucy is here in the audience. Um, so I am I'm sorry, I am sorry, put you on the spot um, because that question is actually more appropriately directed to you. So would you care to respond? Yeah, I mean I suppose there's two levels of honest research levels reaching out to the quite a number of people and then there's the understanding of them legally rather than predetermining. Issues in the team, but within that, absolutely, if there are people cases that look like they would have a broader benefit, we are. Um, I'm working with James and Killian, and we will enhance those as well. So it, it, it is the two two ways of just keeping it open, but then cases will be taken on. I will say also, we do provide outside of individual um, referrals, we've also provided sort of research. Um, opinions to groups, so we have written about the lawfulness of accessing HRT um, from overseas, we've written about um, the Equal Status Act, so we also have done those sort of research bits as well, so if an organisation doesn't have a specific client who's going to um, come forward but does want sort of legal question answered in that regard, so which we've done before. That's great. Uh, thanks very much. Thanks tonight. Sorry for that. Um, so I just want to wrap up and say thanks so much to everyone for coming along this evening. It's really, really great to have you all here. Your support is really, really appreciated. Uh, thank you to our speakers, Mary Paulin, Paula Fagan, and to the Minister. Um, and thank you all for your kind words earlier on. Uh, and to Killian and James, and to our, um, our, to our interpreter, Margaret, uh, for signing this event. Uh, please stay afterwards and enjoy some, some wine and some uh, nibbles and there will be some <laughs> entertainment uh, later on. So just thanks a million for coming along tonight for Mila Mago.